Sweeney, and I'm a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department, and I'm here to welcome you to the library's first annual Plante at the Library program. All right. Whoa, okay. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind-the-scenes staff for helping bring you this Plant Day at the Library program. Uh, today is a celebration of all things plants, so whether you're an experienced green thumb or just a young seedling, we hope you'll be able to enjoy all the different workshops and demonstrations that we have throughout Central Library today. More information about all of today's different programs can be found on one of these handy-dandy plant cards plenty of programs, and if you like today's program, uh, there's a little QR code on the back that ha uh, will link you to a survey, uh, so if you can go ahead and fill that out, and uh, when you do the survey, you can be entered into an opportunity drawing to win a free Lomi food processor. Uh, we'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. Uh, just a couple of other housekeeping tips before we begin. Uh, please silence your electronic devices so do not distract our speakers. Uh, please take a moment to notice the location of the exits at the back inside of the auditoriums, just in case of any emergencies. Uh, please no eating or drinking in the auditorium unless it's bottled water. And if you need the bathrooms, they are down the hallway and to your right. Uh, and if you parked in the garage underneath the library today, you can get your parking ticket validated at the information desk in the main lobby and the parking will only be a dollar as long as you parked after 9.30 and leave before 5.30 and you will need to show your library card in order to get the validation. And if you don't have a library card, you can get one right at the checkout line. And now for our first amazing speaker. Jeanette Marantos is a reporter for the LA Times who focuses on plants, gardening, and Southern California's changing landscapes and writes the monthly LA Times plant newsletter. She spent more than 25 years in central Washington as a daily reporter, columnist, freelancer, journalism teacher, and mom before returning to the land of eucalyptus and sage in 2013. She now lives in Ventura, trying to just transform her yard into an oasis of native plants, fruit trees, and veggies. Today, Jeanette is going to talk about what a habitat garden is and why we should care. During this presentation, you will learn what you need to create a habitat garden, as well as find out about resources for people who want to learn more. And now let's welcome to the stage, Jeanette. Good morning, and thank you for coming out on this rainy day. So I'm Jeanette Marantos. Thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. And I do spend most of my time writing about plants and gardening and our changing landscapes in Southern California. I've covered just about everything during my 20-something years as a reporter, from personal finance and business to law enforcement and health. I even taught high school journalism for a few years. But I began writing about plants five years ago. Um, but plants and gardening have always been an important part of my life. My parents were both great gardeners. My mother could put a stick in the ground and just things would grow. And I was kind of a green thumb wannabe, but honestly, I've been a pretty terrible gardener for most of my life. Uh, for many years, my gardening technique was to put a plant in the ground, wish it luck, and then walk away to tend to family, work, and a billion other things besides my thirsty, weedy garden. So it's only in recent years, through repeated contact with real garden experts that I've come to understand you can't walk away. This is my little epiphany. Gardens need daily attention. A healthy garden needs daily attention. And it repays your love tenfold with flowers and fruit, fragrance, and so much satisfaction. Truly, it was my garden that kept me and lots of other people sane during the pandemic. But I'm probably teach, uh, preaching to the choir about this right now. Today, I want to focus on a relatively new topic for Southern California, adding native plants to our yards and even our balconies and patios to create habitat for birds, insects, and other critters struggling to survive in our urban world. First, I, I want to be clear I am not an expert on habitat and California native plants. My answers come from the real experts, such as the folks at the Theodore Payne Foundation, Tree of Life Nursery, California Botanic Garden, and California Native Plant Society. 
And I'm going to have this slide at the end with um, uh, websites if you want to take a picture of the screen just for future reference because uh, they're really the people who have all the answers. So what is a habitat garden? They're gardens that are made up of plants that grow natively in a region before the colonizers and settlers introduced other plants that reminded them of home. And uh, when I say native plants, they're the ones that were here in the first place. They're the ones that birds and insects and lizards and all those other animals evolved to rely on for food and shelter and nesting materials. Um, through human development and introduction of non-native species, our native plant animals are losing the plants they need to survive. Many butterflies, for instance, need a specific plant to feed their young. For instance, the endangered El Segundo Blue, which requires sea cliff buckwheat in the Palos Verdes Peninsula area. Also in that peninsula, uh, the almost extinct Palos Verdes Blue, which there's a photo of it there. It's almost like a piece of jewelry on her hand. Um, they, they need deer weed or milk vetch for their caterpillars to thrive. Or the Western monarch was probably the most famous example. They need milkweed. Their caterpillars won't eat anything else. So native plants in our, so, okay. So what's the big deal then about this? Native plants in our sprawling metropolitan area have been devastated by development and herbicides. You think, okay, well, why don't they just grow? Well, it's because we cover them up with concrete and we throw pesticides on them to uh, stop weeds on our sides of the road. Uh, white sage habitat gets smaller and smaller because it only grows natively in Southern California and Upper Baja, and we're just covering a lot of its native growing area with development. There's a lot of new herbicides that allow farmers to kill all the plants in a field except for a specific crop. And that's good as far as getting rid of weeds that are hurting the crop, but it's also harmful to these plants like milkweed that used to grow on the edges of this and provided food for those butterflies. Herbicides are still used to eliminate weeds along roads. And even if the native plants survive, the residue on the plants will harm many insects who you try to use them. As insect populations diminish, so do bird populations, because many birds rely on insects, especially caterpillars and spiders, to feed their young. And if they don't eat insects, they rely on native berries and seeds for food, plants that are becoming increasingly rare. So how can we fix this? We can set aside whatever space we have, even if it's only a balcony or a small section of lawn or the front of our business to grow as many native plants as we can. That's something they did over at Dodger Stadium, as a matter of fact. You're gonna hear about that in the next hour. But um, Bruce Schwartz of, uh, of LA Native Plant Source in Eagle Rock has created this huge, he's got this huge yard it's filled almost entirely with what he calls hyper-local native plants. It's kind of inspiring and intimidating to go there because he's created, once upon a time it was just a bunch of overgrown ivy and, and uh, uh, jade plant and non-native plants and garbage that people have thrown in the yard and he had these magnificent oaks kind of rising above it all. And he cleared it out and he started, over many years, started planting these plants that grow natively in northeast LA. But Bruce says you don't have to rip out your entire yard to create a habitat. You can remove a small section of lawn or use pots on a patio to create a native plant victory garden. I just love that idea. Where the food is not for you, but for the wild animals who live there. This is more of his yard and this is Bruce. Now he built that little pathway going up and um, he's just, you know, it, it's, it's so natural looking and it still requires a fair amount of work on his part because he's constantly battling. That's right there, he's weeding. He's just, there's invasive weeds that are constantly threatening the native plants because they grow more quickly.
native plant enthusiast Barbara Chung did just that on her or on her seven by twenty townhouse patio. She planted a whole bunch of natives, over a hundred natives in pots. And she has many bird visitors who dine there, including a mama, Allen's hummingbird, who was feeding her chicks from Barbara's blooming fragrant pitcher sage and hummingbird sage. I asked her just recently, I wrote a story about this a year ago, and I asked her, and she says the mama bird is still there. And she just still comes around and is, is um, uh, gathering nectar from those plants. So assuming this is something you want to do, how, how do you choose what plants you want to use? There's sage, I mean, there's so many choices. There's uh, sages, some of my personal favorites here. Oh, well, this is Baja Spurge, forgive me, this is Baja Spurge. It's a really uh, bird-friendly privacy hedge if you want to, we, we're big on hedges in Southern California for privacy. And these things are great because not only will they um, keep anybody from looking through, but the birds love to roost in there. These are some of my favorite sages. There's hummingbird sage, woolly blue curls, and Cleveland sage. These are some of the most fragrant plants. If you just walk by hummingbird sage, just barely grace it with your foot, the fragrance is so intense and it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's part of having a, a good garden for me, is having something I can smell. Just walking outside and touching the, the plants, it's, it's part of the whole experience for me. There are many organizations that offer detailed suggestions I want to plant. Just do a Google search on native plant growing guides in Southern California and you'll have a full screen of options. But the California Native Plant Society's Calscape and Gardening website are two of the easiest ways to plan for a habitat garden and get information about what plants you need to buy based on your planting space and your zip code. So they're gonna, you can pull up lists of plants that grow natively or well in your particular area and if, it's, if you've got issues like it's a really shady area, um, full sun, you have deer issues, they, they will address a lot of those issues and give you suggestions that are helpful for what to buy. If you're interested in seeing how this works, you can do it easily online, but if you're interested in seeing how it works in person, the California Native Plant Society is going to be at the LA Times Festival of Books on April 20th and 21st at uh, USC. We, we do this festival of books every year, it's huge on the campus there. And we're going to have an LA Times Plants booth with the California Native Plant Society. They're going to bring a big screen and you can come in, give them your zip code, and they will create a list of plants for you right there on the spot and just send it to your email. So these are buckwheats. You can do, I mean, buckwheats come in so many different sizes and shapes and colors. There's um, the uh, Santa Cruz Island buckwheat is the one on the right. They're just, they're, you could just fill your yard with buckwheat and the California buckwheat, which is the one in the center there toward the later stage, the colors go from a sort of, sort of pinkish clouds to these sort of rusty brown colors. And they are, they're like a keystone species for this Southern California area. There's so many, so many insects and pollinators that really love these plants. The Theodore Payne Foundation in Sun Valley, Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano, California Botanic Garden and Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, the state's two largest gardens devoted to California native plants, all have demonstration gardens and loads of information about planting gardens on their websites. One of the best things you can do, especially this time of year, is wander through those gardens and look and, and ask questions. What is this one? Take a picture of it, take it to their offices and say, I want this plant. Because they have nurseries, they're more than happy to help you with this. But here are some basics. If you want to create your own habitat garden space, first and foremost, we have to think, we have to change the way we think about landscaping in Southern California. We don't have water to sustain 
yards with tropical plants or English manor style lawns and gardens. We just don't have that anymore. And we need to think about plants as more than ornaments. They are critically important parts of our world that provide food, shelter, fragrance, and beauty. I passionately believe that those of us lucky enough to have yards, even tiny yards and patios, can make ourselves and everyone around us happier and healthier by growing a wild diversity of plants with a heavy emphasis on plants that are native to our region. I'm not saying that you have to eliminate all ornamentals. I, I love roses. I have roses in my yard as well. But if you want a lawn even, maybe you want to have a little lawn, but consider reducing its size by adding planting areas for native trees and shrubs. So when I say we have to change the way we think about landscaping, just understand that many of Southern California's native plants go dormant in the summer. So it's not gonna be this sort of unchanging, a lot of our landscapes, it's like we roll out the lawn, we have a few shrubs that somebody comes and trims into a square shape or a round ball or whatever, and maybe somebody plants some flowers that last for a few weeks and then you put some more in. Um, native plants, a lot of them, especially the wildflowers, they have a season, and when the season's over, they're gonna go brown, and you've gotta make a decision. Is that, do we want that brown look? It's a palette. Some people are okay with that. Other people, um, as you can see here, these are gold, gold fields or fields of gold? Gold, California gold fields, okay. They're, they're really cute little wildflowers, and they're, here they are toward the end of the season, and you can see, this is Bruce Schwartz's house, you see on the right, it was just a mass of golden flowers and it turns brown at the end of the season. And what he does is he goes in, that's Bruce on the right, and he just kind of crumples them up to re make those seeds go, disperse them around on the ground so they'll come back in the next year. Uh, he doesn't do anything more with it, but you can. You could have perennials in there. Um, you can see Evan Meyer, he's the executive director of Theodore Payne Foundation, and he was showing me, you know, he takes the wildflowers and he'll just clip them up to add mulch on the ground because that's one of the things you really want to do in a habitat garden. Is you want to leave as much of those plants in the garden even after they die because those, those pieces, they add nesting materials, they add um, places for insects and and that leaf litter, they add little little shelters for animals. And they also add a mulch that helps keep the moisture in the ground and help eventually decompose and feed the plants. So if you just love wildflowers, you need to understand that it's not gonna be Disneyland 12 months out of the year. You're gonna have this spectacular show like you can see on the left there. Um, the spectacular show of wildflowers, and that's not all natives, but that's gonna happen, and then they're gonna fade away. And, and it, you can see in the middle here, let me go back to that slide. In the middle, um, there's just these, some of the last wildflowers, they're called Farewell to Spring, and they're just these last little hanger-ons, these little beautiful purple wildflowers. Uh, but the rest of that, that was all a wildflower bed, and it's the rest of them are just little brown stalks now. So you, um, you just have to say, well, what am I going to do? How can I rotate in things? So one of my answers has been um, I add sunflowers. I'm kind of a, and these are, some of these are hybrids. These are not all native sunflowers, but I'm just kind of in love with the miracle of sunflowers. You take this tiny little seed, and you put it in the ground, and you get this thing that grows with a, it's got a stem larger than my arm. It's just, it's just astonishing. And it, and it always impresses. <laughs> People walk by and they're like, wow, this is so tall. So it's fun and it, and it makes me happy. So um, anyway, my landscape is a hodgepodge of California native plants interspersed with uh, Mediterranean climate plants like rosemary, olive, lavender, I've got some roses in there, like I said, vegetables, greens, and fruit trees. My native plants include two elderberries, a desert willow, which has these really frilly pinkish flowers that have a vanilla scent to them. They're quite lovely. 
Uh, there's Cleveland sage, hummingbird sage, white sage, uh, Dara's choice, which is a, a black sage hybrid. And I think Sonoma sage is the other part of that. Um, buckwheats, uh, Delamina verbena, which is a really, really profuse of bloomer. Um, Attila hot poppy, which can take over the world if you're not careful, so, you know, use that sparingly. <laughs> uh, California fuchsia, mints, and mallows. I also have a ton of wildflowers that die by midsummer, but by then my sages, buckwheats, towering artichokes, and wildflowers, or sunflowers, are thriving and covering up the remains of my wildflowers. So when you're planning your habitat garden, consider your tolerance for the brown au naturel look during the summer, and make sure you choose a variety of plants that can provide color and fragrance year round. Tim Becker, horticulture director of the Theodore Payne Foundation, says a proper habitat garden must supply four things, food, water, shelter, and nesting materials. And when I say food, that can be everything from the leaves to the nectar, the berries, uh, the insects. Milkweed attracts a lot of insects, like aphids, these bright orange aphids, which are not wonderful, but I really had to resist because then what happens is that the ladybugs come and they go after those aphids. So it's it's nice, but uh, you have to have a, you have to, sort of sit on your hands. <laughs> you don't like to have those aphids covering your plants. Um, or you can wash them off with water if you want to. Uh, moving water is best, especially if you're worried about mosquitoes. So some kind of a fountain that can keep the water moving. Um, the shelter piece is like the dense shubs I showed you at the beginning with the Baja Spurge. Places where animals can hide and um, and nest if they need to. And then the nesting materials are grasses and twigs, even cobwebs. And this is really hard for me. I'm not a fan of seeing my plants covered in spider webs. So I've had to, I'm still making my peace with that one. But the spider webs are good for the nesting materials. And when you start choosing your plants, especially perennial, Becker says to add multiples of as many different plants as you can. So if you want an incredibly fragrant Cleveland sage in your yard, don't just plant one, plant three. Have multiples in there to, it, it, it fills in the area, but it also is good for the, the, the bees and the, or the pollinators that come in there to find multiples of that plant. Um, and it just, yeah, it provides plenty of food for your animal victory garden. Be sure to sow annuals like wildflowers because they'll recede in your garden for new blooms every spring and provide food for animals. I, I think my neighbors might think I'm a little crazy because when it starts raining, I like to run outside and throw seeds. <laughs> so the seeds there to see if I can get them going. Uh, but just don't plant flowers. If you have room, add a tree. Oh, these are more. That's Dara's uh, choice, uh, the hybrid sage on the right. but. If you can add a tree, an oak tree is another keystone species that feeds so many animals, it's so critical, including humans. Humans lived on the acorns and they just were wonderful trees for our, everybody. But they're also slow growers and they take up a lot of space. Elderberry is another really good tree for habitat and for food production and they smell, I just, I love the smell of elderberries. Um, they also grow quickly, and this, this tree that is here is next to my uh, house, and I planted it three years ago, and I'd say it's about 15 feet now. It just likes that space. It's in full sun. Um, it was in a four-inch pot when I planted it. Shrubs like sagebrush, lemonade berry, coffee berry, the Baja Surge, or Spurge, and Toyone, um, which is the California holly, they can go to the size of small trees and be shaped into hedges. They provide lots of dense shelter, flowers, and beautiful berries that delight birds as well as people. Grasses, oh, these are more of the trees. This is a Palo, uh, Palo Verde, uh, which has these extraordinary yellow blooms. If you ever go to Sunnyland, they have a visitor center out there in Palm Springs. And 
this time of year in April, all our Palo Verde trees, they just mostly have natives planted in the visitor center. And it's, it's just a sight to see because it's, it's just all these golden trees. And then uh, this is the desert willow that I was telling you about that has those beautiful blooms. That's ceanothus, a couple of varieties of ceanothus, and then of course the grasses. I think that's purple needle grass that I've got there. But you'll need more than the plants, as we said before. There's a water source. Uh, animals need water, preferably moving water. This is my project for 2024. I want a fountain or some kind of water source that lets them drink and bathe. That's really important, especially as things get hotter. The animals need to drink too. And also note, as I said before, mosquitoes don't like moving water and we don't want to encourage the mosquitoes. Uh, you need to have, those are different water. This is something that Bruce Schwartz built here that with the rock wall, um, just there's lots of options out there. These are little quintets, or they're tiny bubblers, the one in the right, top right corner. Um, they just, you have to plug them in, but they have, they just squirt up little water, so there's just constant watering for bees and smaller pollinators and stuff. But you need to make, <laughs> you need to make peace with messiness. And when I say messiness, there are some people who if there's a leaf on the ground, they just have a fit. Bring out the blower and get rid of those leaves and blah, blah, blah. A habitat garden is not a, it, it's gonna have a little messiness. It's not going to be a perfectly sculpted space. It's going to be wild. And that's, that's kind of, for me, that's kind of the attraction. You have to give up the idea of a tidy yard, says Tim Becker, to create habitat for wildlife. Think of a meadow or forest rather than sterile green turf or hard packed dirt. But you still need to weed. Sorry, it's part of the life. We have a lot of weeds out there that will overtake your native plants if you let them just go completely wild. So you have to go out there and keep your eye on all those dandelions and nut sedges and all those things out there that just want to take over your garden. You still have to go out and weed them. And Bruce says that's his biggest job these days is he just goes out every day searching for weeds. So Evan Meyer, who's the executive director of Theodore Payne, says, you know, the best gardens look like nobody was there, which means you work incredibly hard to look like you've done nothing at all. And I think that's the epitome <laughs> of what Bruce Schwartz has done. Beyond weeding, the best rule of thumb for your habitat garden is just leave it alone. A lot of traditional tidying like raking or God forbid blowing away leaves takes away the things that create habitat for animals. Add mulch to your garden like small wood chips to help control leaves, I mean weeds, and retain moisture in the ground. That's really important. But let leaf litter accumulate too. We don't have to rake up those leaves. It provides food, shelter, nesting materials, and as it decomposes, it provides food for the plants. Leave seed pods on your plants when they die back in summer or winter. These can look, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen, and this doesn't happen much here, obviously, because we don't get the snow, but it is something kind of beautiful about having these, um, oh, rose hips, or those aren't natives, but having these, these grasses and stuff with their seeds on them sort of poking out of the otherwise sort of brown area. It's just, it, to me, it's beautiful. It's just sort of um, interesting, natural part of the, of our world, and it may not be popular with your neighbors, but it's gonna be popular with the animals. Leave those aphids or other bugs you discover on your native plants because those bugs provide food for other bugs and birds. Don't be alarmed and don't spray because they're part of the whole process, Becker says. You won't have ladybugs if you don't have aphids. Drag a log or two into your habitat and let it slowly decompose. The logs not only add interest, they provide moisture and a place for animals to hide. 
Large stones also add interest, provide shelter, and help retain moisture. This on the right is um, pre, wow, I just lost it. It's a native plant garden in Long Beach. That's just, the name of it just ran out of my head. But it's, uh, he created a slag pile to plant on just to create some, you know, we're used to having flat yards because of our lawns and the maintenance for those lawns, but uh, it's, there's no reason with a habitat garden that you can't create little hills, and you can, you can plant on both sides of those hills. You have to let go a little bit to have a real habitat garden, Becker says. You have to expand your threshold of what's wild and acceptable. And that's what I mean when I think we have to rechange the way we think about landscaping. So this is information. Um, this is that slide I promised you about trying to find uh, other resources and other organizations that can help you for inspiration. The Theodore Payne Foundation, Sun Valley, California Native Plant Society, the California Botanic Garden, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Uh, they're just so worth a visit if you can, you know, trip up to Santa Barbara into Claremont for the California Botanic Garden. And the Tree of Life's Nursery in San Juan Capistrano. Just, uh, it's been there for over 40 years. Uh, survived when a lot of other nurseries did not, even though people were at first surprised that a native plant nursery was there at all. And if you're interested in keeping up with plant activities, you can scan this QR code with your phones to sign up for the LA Times Plants newsletter, which comes out once a month into your email. And uh, it's free. And we would, it's just a list of plant activities and plant related news, of which there's a surprising amount. So thank you for listening. And I'm wondering, do, do you want to do questions? Do we? Do we have a little time? I don't know if anyone was interested in questions, and I can do my best to answer them. But uh, thank you. Oh, oh, Chess. What's your watering routine look like in the summer? I, I have a lot of um, fruit trees and vegetables. So I have a drip irrigation that I use to keep those plants watered and the water from those plants takes care of the native plants that are around them. You have to be careful, that's a really good point. You, you, if you give native plants too much water, they've adapted to be a low water, um, a low water plants. And if you give them too much water, they'll rot or they just won't flourish. White sage does not like a lot of water. Oaks do not like a lot of water. They're just, they've adapted over time to uh, live with very little water. So I know some people who really don't, if it's, it's a whole native plant garden, they don't have um, you know, any irrigation per se. They'll might go out if it's really hot and periodically water with a hose. But they are not doing the rainbird sprinkler thing. Uh, that's just, you don't need that and you don't want it with a lot of native plants. Thank you, that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, the oak tree, the, they, get, they get huge. Um, I think if you walk around our neighborhoods and you see neighborhoods with oak trees, you can see they will take up a huge part of somebody's yard. Uh, but they grow slowly, so it's not gonna happen overnight. Elderberry is gonna grow much faster. Uh, but you wanna, you wanna put that space there and know that you're gonna be living in shade when that tree gets to a size. So I'd say, I, I don't know what, what to say about how much size you would need, but you would need a fair amount of size. Either that or as it's growing, just realize that a lot of things are gonna get shaded out and may not survive that change. Um, I'm sorry, you asked me. <laughs> I, I could go out daily and it wouldn't be often enough. Um, I, I, try, I usually spend at least an hour or two in the weekends. 
I, I talked to someone who said that she doesn't mind reading because it's become a meditation for her, and I'm kind of coming over to that idea. There's something satisfying about reading in that you can see where you started and you can see where you ended, and uh, that doesn't happen very often in my work. Uh, a lot of times it's just you empty the pile and it fills up immediately. And so weeding, weeding is part of the, the, any kind of gardener's life, but it doesn't have to be a terrible chore. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to bring a microphone because we are recording the program. We there's have time. a, there's a, um, a woman here. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. And then uh, I think she'll be around afterwards as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm so, going to be here to uh, listen to the Yeah, next so one more question, and then uh, we will ask everyone to uh, exit the auditorium so we can prepare for the 12 o'clock. Uh, so it'll be a very short wait. Uh, so last question, and then. Uh, I just wanted to know where you got your sage plants from. I'm sorry, I couldn't your hear. Your sage plants? Where did you get them from? Oh, the sage plants. Um, there's so many places I, I cannot recommend. Um, I, I mean, LA Native Plant Source sells plants uh, in, in Highland Park. You can go online and order them uh, and then pick them up. He's, cause he runs this out of his home and everything he makes there, he donates at the NR Paid Foundation. Theodore Payne Foundation, uh, California Botanic Garden, they both have tremendous nurseries, as does Tree of Life in San Juan Capistrano. You can go there and browse, and they have a huge selection of, of a variety of sages. Uh, there's, am I missing any important? Well, El Notivo, but they're, they're a wholesaler. Yeah, you can't. Okay. Sage is a kind of salvia. There's, there's so many varieties of sages, but they have, most of them, have a pretty distinctive fragrance. And some of them are, they range from a very um, uh, sharp fragrance, like white sage. I, I'm, I'm addicted to it. I have one outside my front door, and I say hello to it every morning when I go out and get my paper, and just, just the fragrance of it to something like uh, the hummingbird sage, which is almost, it's so sweet, it's almost like bubble gum. Um, th there are just there's so many varieties. There's, a, there's a, a kind of sage that we cook with, which is, it's, it's got similar qualities. It's also fragrant. But uh, this, this, the sages that they're out there, there's so many varieties of them and colors. Um, but there are a variety of salvia, and there's some ornamental salvias that are not natives. That's why I recommend going to a, a native plant nursery to see what they've got there. Go to their demonstration gardens and see them in bloom, and then you can really see and, and touch them. Don't, you know, grab them, but just, just give them a little touch, and you can see how fragrant they are. It's, to me, a, a garden that doesn't have fragrance is sterile. I, I've got to have that fragrance because it's such a part of the experience for me. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. So if we can have everyone just step out of the auditorium while we prepare for the next presentation. It'll be a very short wait. Um, you can have your photos taken in the lobby uh, while you wait. Um, and then we'll see everybody in about 10 minutes. Thank you.